Hi. Hey, Robin. Hello. How's it going? I'm good. I just got back home from the studio. Um, thank you so much for doing this. So, um, basically, I think the guys probably kind of gave you a brief like overview, but really, just um, what I'm kind of doing is I'm interviewing everyone that's on the album, and then some people that aren't as well, just to kind of um, piece together the story of this album a bit, and kind of to piece together um, the relationship with electronic music, and I'll sort of um, just talk a bit about how you know how we've all ended up here and making the music that we're making and sort of to just like have a conversation about it. Uh, for me, you know, I've been a fan of your music for quite some time and I'm just following your, your releases and your albums. I think one of the things that separates you from me from, you know, other pop artists is that you have this, um, this simultaneous love for pop music, but also underground electronic music. And I think that it's so evident in your music, um, your appreciation for underground electronic music and dance culture. Um, and I think that's evident in the people you choose to remix your records, the instrumental um, composition of your album, and even the music you play in your DJ sets. Um, so really, I wanted to kind of dive into this a bit. And I just had like a, a bunch of questions um, that I, I thought could be cool to talk about. So um, I kind of wanted to start off with, do you have any particular memory of like a, a first rave or kind of first experience with electronic music? Did you have like a, a light bulb moment where you were in like a certain time or place or party where you remember experiencing and being like, wow, what is this? I did. And what was that? And I've heard about it many times, um, but it really is one, one occasion. And it was when I was, I think I was 17 and I was spending a lot of time in New York because I released my first album there at that time. And I had a, um, a manager that used to live in New York when he was younger and he introduced me to, to you know, house music. And um, my first real experience of a, you know, a proper club was when he took me to the shelter, which was um, a location in New York that had been around since the, the 80s. And um, there was still clubs going there. A lot of the original clubs were not around, but um, Louis Vega had a night, or he had a, a club on Sundays in the, in the afternoon, which was called Body and Soul. And he, um, he was spinning there on a Sunday. And uh, I went there with my with my manager, and it was a totally different experience from you know I'd been to waves or you know clubs in Stockholm, but this was very different. And I remember thinking, okay, this is where the music that I love comes from. Like I really sensed that the culture was created in a space like this because it was. It was all ages. It wasn't just people, you know, young people. It was older people. It was people that had been clubbing and going to these parties since the 70s. There were young kids there, like young break dancers. There were people sleeping on the side of the room. You know, they were there since Saturday and they were like with their head, like earmuffs, like getting some sleep and there were lots of baby powder on the floor from all the dancing yeah. and um, and what what kind of what what felt different then about that party to what you'd seen before was it i guess like the overall energy in that room did it just feel completely different to anything you'd seen before and was it did it feel like a connecting of dots of sorts yeah i mean many different things like if you go to you know, good parties are at, at locations that have an energy that's either it's just there or somebody chose the location and, and worked with it in a way so that when you enter, there's already an experience walking into the place. And the shelter had that with like this long corridor. You, you know, I also recognize the energy from like, I grew up, my parents made theater when I was growing up, so I was used to like knowing what it should feel like when things, 
when you're holding space for other people. Yeah. Like it's not, you know, the diff there are different ways of performing and there are different ways of like reaching an audience. And I think a DJ do, does the same thing or a club can do the same thing in a similar way to a church or a ceremony or a place where people can feel safe. And um, I recognized some of that energy from when I was growing up, you know, with you know, certain performers or certain like sages or certain like cultural spaces where you just felt like there was real intention behind what was going yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's, it's interesting what you say about like that kind of almost church like attitude, like a, a, a place of like, of ceremony and also almost like worship and also being like a, a a safe space for marginalized communities and kind of that that place being an outpouring of emotion where maybe that those things couldn't be expressed in like a day-to-day -day life and i think that um any any time i've kind of experienced um a party that kind of has that different energy that it becomes more than just like music in a loud room with people dancing you know it's like it's the thing that's kind of bigger than the sum of its parts. And I think that's a, it's like a, a really beautiful thing. It mm. is. It's a special uh, atmosphere. You know, it can be entering a performance space, a theater, it can be entering a school, it can be entering a church, it can be entering a club, but you know that feeling, you come into a space and you know that there are, um, Everyone's a part of yeah. something. You enter it and you're a part of something together with other people. It's not about yeah, exactly. you. It's about what you're experiencing together. And, and every single one of my best memories in nightlife kind of has that, I think. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so hard. I think many people kind of look at, um, I think people that aren't as maybe involved in like nightlife and, and dance culture it's very easy to look at it as like a, a hedonistic thing or this kind of just like, you know, something people do just to kind of like um, release energy or something. But it's, uh, I think that the reason that so many people are so invested in electronic music, like they are, is, is exactly that, you know, it's like this kind of, um, those experiences are, when I, when I look back on my life, it's like the, some of the most profound experiences in my entire life are like experiencing that music in a setting like, and with friends or people I've never met and kind of and coming away with like a different perspective and I think that um I think that that's that's what kind of for me like draws me to this and is why I've made the album I've made but it's um no I know it's cool when you when you know what that should feel like and then you can compare it to other experiences you know the more experiences you have like that the more information you have to compare and use when you come into new places. Mm -hmm. So you can bring that like experience with you into a place where there might be people who haven't experienced that and you can help create that energy for other people. You know, like I don't feel that I feel that responsibility sometimes as a DJ. Like if you go into a club and it might be a more commercial or less intimate feeling than you would have hoped for. You feel a responsibility to to create like a, an experience for people, or do you feel like you are usually or often pushed into doing what's expected of you? I think um I think it's always interesting turning up to somewhere and kind of you know feeling that energy as soon as you walk through the door. And, it, and it's, it's pretty obvious to me, usually within the first 10 minutes of being somewhere, um, what the current situation is. And I think that sometimes I always, um, I always aim to try and create feelings of like togetherness or euphoria through like whatever I'm playing. And I'm kind of, it's almost like a, you have several paths you can go down as a DJ when you start playing. And, and many times I've, I've failed, like I've been DJing and I've, I've been in a, an environment that feels more commercial or kind of a more forced environment. And I've tried to go down a path musically and just fall flat on my face, either because I'm not on the same wavelength with the crowd or it's not like a crowd that like 
care about what I want to play or they just want to hear a certain thing. And I, and I think that um, I think that you of all people have uh, such an experience of that because you've you've had such a success as a as a pop artist in like a commercial sense, but you've also had a cultural success in electronic music and you know and the appreciation that your that you have is fed back to you through your fans so it's like you know there are some environments you know we've spoken lots of times about Rhonda and like the party that you threw there and stuff where all those people all those fans of yours know that they they trust if you're DJing they're going to trust what you're going to play and, and then I think that they're going to be like on board to come on that journey with you but then I think that well, from my experience, I've been in environments where you have to win those people over, and, and sometimes it's not always the easiest thing to do. And it might and it might be because they've come to hear a song that you've made, and that's about as far as it goes. You Knowing that for some people it is, it's it's like oh, if they've come to hear X, Y, Z, and that's what they've come to kind of get out the night. So it's a uh, it's it's always a funny balance, kind of speaking to fans or just responding to fans when. Because if I play the live show, then the chances are I'll play all the songs that they want to hear. But it's like if I'm DJing, I might not play the song they want to hear. Because if I walked into, you know, New York warehouse space and it's going crazy, I'm probably not going to play um, Warm, which is like a 100 BPM song of mine that's like very slow. And it's like, and then I'll, I'll always get those messages after being like, ah, oh, why didn't you play that? But it's, uh, you know, and I, I kind of, I empathize with the, people is like I understand their, their feelings and it's uh I understand where it comes from but it's uh it's always like a catch-22 for me really I think that it's I always think about that when I when I play live when I play with my band too like sometimes I mean I've done so many shows where in the beginning where it was just like the most horrible audience ever people who didn't know my music you know like you have to do like hundreds of those shows before you you really know what you're doing, you know? And um, so they all have a purpose, even though they're very, like sometimes they're kind of painful to get through. But I think uh, what I always remember thinking and what I still think about is I remember being a person at a show where the crowd wasn't so great, but I had a really good experience. And I always try to think about, you know, that there might be, one of those people in the crowd that is having like an, a moment because you played something that they never heard before or that they really love. You kind of like gave them an experience and they're never going to be able to tell you. You're never going to know they're there because it's just somebody that you're never going to meet. But I remember, I've been that person, you know. That's what I think about. I think about that one person that might have a great yeah. night. <laughs> and it's like that. That moment might not always, because I think when you play shows, it's easy for the big moment, the big reactive moment. You, obviously, you get that immediate feedback. If it's like a loud moment, if the crowd cheer or they dance, then you know you're going to get that immediate feedback. But when I think of some of my like favorite musical experiences live as a fan in the audience, they can they've been quiet moments too. You know, it's like it's when a song is played that affects you so emotionally that you're just like in tears or something and it's like but there's no way of ever knowing if people you know unless you focus in on the crowd and look at each person you're never going to know if someone's moved to tears by something you've done or you know so it's uh it, you're right it's like there's that lack of kind of immediate feedback is uh you'll, you'll never know what you've kind of delivered for someone but you kind of have to have faith that you have i guess um i, I, I think it's like with it you know if you stick with it that's when you that's when you get your point across like when, when you start flipping around then it's like the message gets lost but if you're sticking with what you think is right and you hold on to it there might be a tipping point during the evening where they're like connecting with what you're doing and but it's like you have to risk something to get there and I think also the risk is what wins people over like they understand that, you know, this person is like sticking with it and we're going to have to kind of like follow. It's, yeah, it's like those, my, my favorite DJ experiences in terms of as a, being a punter in the crowd 
is when someone takes you somewhere that you would never have thought of or expected to go. And it's like that, that for me is like a great DJ. And, you know, it's a, and that payoff is so much larger than just giving the person what, you know, giving the crowd what they want straight away. It's like, you know, how do you arrive at that moment? And I think that that's far more exciting. And I think that the far more memorable, you know, it's like, there's a, there's a DJ I love called Yob Yobsi. He's, um, and he, he's, I love him because he, he'll go on a jet, he'll play the most like insane, like he'll play those records that everyone knows. So he like, he played Sonique, Feels So Good. But in order to get there, he played like an hour and a half of like 90s trance and like obscure breakbeat. So it's like, once you arrive at that moment, he then kind of found the like the segue in terms of the breakbeat and kind of all of a sudden you arrive at this moment and the, the euphoria is just like overwhelming because it's like to get there, it's been such a, you're like waiting to find out and like that's the exciting thing. It's like if he just went on stage and played Sonique Feels So Good straight away, it'd be like, oh, cool, whatever. Like that's, it's a good song, but like to arrive there and be like, no way, like, I can't believe he's played that record. Like, that's, that's just incredible, you know? Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I think, um, I don't, I think it was, uh, my friend who told me that Larry Levon, he played this remix that he made of Gwen Guthrie. I think, I think it was a Paradise Garage and he played it, I think 30 times in a row. 30 One night. times? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was a good song. People just needed to hear it enough times and then they would get, get it. It's you know? incredible. So he would just, he just started the whole night just playing that 30 times or something. Wow. That's amazing. Um, I. I was, um, Noel Rogers has a really good story about when Sheik made their first single. Um, I think it was Everybody Dance or something like that, but he was, he has this, the long short of the story is, um, he got invited to Studio 54 because his friend was DJing to see him play it. So he goes up and when the DJ plays it, um, it gets to the end, like the crowd erupts. And Niall has never seen anything like this. It's like the start of Sheik and he's like, when it gets to the end of the record, the crowd boo the DJ. So he just keeps having to play the record until like eventually the crowd let him stop playing Everybody Dance because like they've had enough. But it is like five times over just playing the same song. It's like, I've, I've never seen that, but like, yeah, that must be crazy. <laughs> but 30 times. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, something like yeah. that. I think it's just different kind of trajectory in a club like it's not about the easy and quick fixes it's about like listening to things in a very different way like mm -hmm. having patience and letting yourself be like lulled into a state of mind you know mm, definitely um so i was going to uh just move on to this kind of next question i had which was basically um which was uh you kind of, uh, upon kind of watching some of your interviews and your RBMA um, doc, uh, lecture, sorry, um, you were kind of talking of like the first three albums being almost like a kind of a separate phase of your career to um, the birth of Kenichiwa Records um, and the release of, and that kind of being the, the start of like a new era. Um, and for me, kind of listening to that, there's a, there's a clear electronic influence that, um, that kind of, rears its head at that point um i just kind of wanted to ask is that was that a result of kind of new influences or was that something you'd always wanted to do and perhaps just hadn't like had the opportunity to yet um or was there like a new album or was there a particular kind of genre of music that you heard that then kind of inserted itself into your psyche and, and changed the way you make music I think I'd had all these ideas for a long time about like what kind of music that I wanted to make and I just wasn't around people that knew how to make mm. it. Right. Uh, yeah, interesting. Not, you know, I was a songwriter already, but I was not a producer and it was very difficult for me to convince people like 
you know, more experienced producers to try my ideas. And I think that that's also why I started my label because I was just so um, <sighs> disillusioned by like working that way. So I needed to create like a safe space where I could, you know, try and work with producers and, and um, musicians that were, you know, open to the things that I wanted to do. And when I did that, I think it was quite easy. I just went back to, you know, whether it was like Nana Cherry or whether it was Prince or uh, Michael Jackson or um, Janet Jackson or, you know, all these things that I had grown up with. I retraced those records. You know, I traced them back. I realized, you know, I think that's where like my whole, I, I took the time to discover, you know, where does this music come from? So Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, Prince, like how they work together, what came out of that? Um, how does all the kind of club music that I grew up with relate to someone like Nana and Terry? Okay, there's like the, the rave scene in the UK. I grew up with the, that music. I grew up with all those hits, but I never knew where it came from. So even though I had this experience of what club music was in the, in the US, that was still so underground to me. Like it was such an underground culture that there was, it was really difficult for me to connect with the pop music that I had grown up with. But once I started looking at all those albums, I realized that they were totally directly connected to the dance yeah. music that I loved in the present time. And I just started like connecting all the dots and became like a student for like a long time just um, studying like things that I liked and you know I got interested in working with different other kinds of producers and other kinds of artists mm. um, amazing it's um it's funny you say that because really with this album before I started making it I'd always I always produced electronic music but this was um there was a space kind of between what I'd done before and what I was doing now where I just started reading a lot and it was I read a book called um, Love Saves the Day which is kind of all, like, all about well you might have read it it's about you know New York and the birth of disco and Paradise Garage and Loft and stuff and I was just they had these playlists in the book and once I was listening to the playlists just all these songs I didn't even realize I knew and they you know they've been sampled in hip-hop and kind of all those hits that like they're such huge hits that you don't even know where they're from they're just in your psyche somewhere from like growing up and stuff um which is which is awesome um but kind of doing that stuff is it's been such a kind of rewarding experience to like to um dive into that and kind of now understand like um where so many of the things that i resonate with come from and kind of back chasing those steps um i wanted to ask you um on honey um your most recent album amazing album love it very much it's um there's on a song called uh, Send to Robin Immediately, you chose to sample uh, Lil Louis, French Kiss. And uh, even long before I knew you and long before doing this interview, I, I wanted to ask you why you sampled that song or what your connection was to that song, because I, I, I love that song. And, uh, and when I, I remember hearing you play it live, I think before, it was the LA show with Channel, and it, it only then just clicked that, because I heard that kind of sample coming in and I was like, what? Like, oh my God, because um, I'd been playing the record a couple of years, but um, is there any kind of story behind how that ended up on the album? Well, that's one of those songs that I, that I grew up mm -hmm. with. So when I was like at the, you know, the school, school disco, when I was like 14, <laughs> that was like, you know, what we danced to. 14, and they would put Lil Louis French Kiss on. That, that yeah, it was a hit. Yeah. It was a total hit in Sweden at the time. Really? Like, that was the thing. Like, underground music was on the charts. That's so cool. See, like, that's so alien to me for such a, like, I, I think that's such a cool record for that to be, like, you know, a school disco song. And, you know, did it have the bit, you know, in the, obviously in the middle of the breakdown where it slows and there's, like, the orgasm happening? <laughs> That's why we love it because we were like so good. You know. That's incredible. That was cool. Yeah, and I think I just kept listening to. I always come back to that song. I always come back to the rhythm of it. I always come back to the beats, all this the sound, and I always wanted to write songs on stuff like that. And like 
um, I was listening to a lot of club music at that when I was making the last album. I was clubbing a lot. I was talking about club music a lot with my friends, and one of them was Adam Kindness. Yeah. And just we just both kept saying like how amazing it would be to sample French yeah. Kiss. Uh, and then he just did. Like he did it without telling me. He did it and he sent it to me. And I just I just wrote a song. Amazing. Um how did you meet yeah. kindness? Adam and I met I don't know, like uh, 2013 maybe and I got in touch with them because I love the album that they had just put out the second album I think first album and and we just became friends like we just started working together we talked about it for a long time and then we started sending things to each other and I was starting to do things for for the honey album although it was really early like around 2014 maybe and we just stayed friends we just stayed friends we stayed talking i made some vocals and stuff for their second album and then we just kept kept the vibe going into into this period when i started writing for my album um, so with honey um do you feel like you had the club in mind or in your music in general? When you're making music, do you have the dance floor and the club in mind or is it purely kind of the feeling in the studio and the songwriting? Because um, I'm interested to ask because I've, I've made projects that have had no consideration of dance floor, but then this album has very much been like mind on the dance floor the whole time and, and considering the club. So what, is there, does it differ from album to album to you, for you? Mm, I mean, I think I'm still trying to figure out the right balance between music, pop music and dance music. To me, the best music is both. Yeah. And the best, the best versions of it is like when when it doesn't feel like you just like looped something and put a vocal on top of it, you know, where it's really a song, a writ written song, but it still works in the club. And it's like the most difficult thing to do. It is, um, but I would, you know, I'd, I'd say that you, you should give yourself some credit that you've, you've nailed it a fair few times. So it's a, uh, it's it's a pretty golden space to create music in, but there's there's lots of records of yours that uh, you nail that balance very very well. <laughs> I, mean, I think it, it would be interesting to make an album that I mean I don't know exactly what I'll do for the next album, but I think it'd be a challenge to make an album that doesn't have a lot of four to the floor kick, but that still feels like a club mm -hmm. album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be cool. It's um. I think that line is so thin, like you say, it's like, because, you know, sometimes I go to a club and you listen to real like club music, like just music that almost doesn't exist outside the club. And sometimes when I listen to a lot of that music and then I listen back to my music, I'm like, oh, it, it's like, you know, it's not clubby enough or kind of, um, right. but it's, it's so easy for it to tip over into that world. And like you say, all my favorite music is, music that kind of manages to exist in both and um you know yeah. like kings of tomorrow finally or something like that you know it's like it's songs or um lovebirds want you in my soul is like one of my favorite songs and it's those it's right. and you're right it's it never really tends to be songs that just loop you know it's like there's there's a motor progression through both change of instrumentation or kind of or the lyrics or melody and it's uh but that I think that's really like the only ultimate goal that I have in music is like if I can, I mean right now anyway, is to try and just create music that kind of strikes our balance and lives between those worlds. Well, you're doing really well too. I mean, I think that's, I think Impact does I that. Think, yeah. It doesn't feel like a straight up club record even though it's super Definitely. clubby. Definitely. It's, um, 
I, I, you know, I'm super. It's, I love how slow it yeah, is. Yeah, it's it's one sixteen, so it's like it, and it doesn't feel slow, like because the most one sixteen yeah. tunes I have are like slow, disco-y kind of like funk tunes, but it's so. The thing about impact is it's so aggy like the bass it's like it's angry and <laughs> it's like and if it was like faster it would be quite intense it would be like yeah. <clears throat> so it's like the energy from just how in your face that bass line is um picks it yeah. up from what in 16 i think yeah yeah, yeah it's like Rock and rolly kind yeah. of a feeling, you know. Yeah. Rock and roll. It, it has an almost kind of yeah. Uh, I think that the intensity of it, but the fact that it's that slow allows it to kind of groove, and it's like it just feels good, and it's like. Uh, well, you can speed it up. I tried like when I did it the other uh -huh. day. I was playing it in different ways and stuff. It sounds good in like 25. Really? Yeah. Okay, cool. I have to check because I've, I've played it at like 120 because, you know, I'm sort of hanging around there a lot when I'm DJing, especially, or depends, depends where you go. Sometimes I end up at like 135, but it's, uh, it's always felt good speeding it up. It's never felt like over the top, but no, I'm, I'm. I mean, maybe 25 is a lot, but like you can go up to 20, 22 or something yeah. and it does, I mean, it's, it's of course, it depends on what you play before or after, but it, it doesn't feel crazy. Mm. Yeah. No, definitely. I'm, 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 so, I'm, it's funny, like, I'm so proud of this song. It's like, you know, there's, there's some music yeah. that you make that, you know, I'm, I've never released anything that I'm not proud of, you know, but I really, if you were to ask me what my favorite song is right now, and I've never had this, I'd probably say Impact, <laughs> which sounds so ridiculous. It's like, uh, but I just, you know, I feel, I, I like listening to it. It feels great. Yeah. <laughs> which good. is I've never had that before which is funny because my friends know that I'm always like I'm quite shy with my music if anyone plays my music I go into a hole and die so but they're they're weirded out because I'm like proud of it <laughs> uh, yeah so um we kind of earlier we were, we were chatting a little bit about you know the, the sort of safe spaces that clubs and um dance music and dance culture, the kind of spaces that uh, are created for, and especially for LGBTQ community, you know? And um, you, uh, you're an avid ally of the LGBTQ community. And um, from what I've seen, um, you're greatly loved back by the community as well. Um, so I kind of wanted to just ask you, like, you know, having uh, had that back and forth with your fans, have you, what, what, what have you learned from your LGBTQ fans and has, have you learned anything and has their appreciation for your music in turn influenced the way that you make music now, do you think? Um, of course, my audience, in, you know, inspires me all the time. I think that what, you know, what makes me feel at home in the queer community is that there is a questioning of like, what's real? Uh, that I feel connected to like even before I was clubbing. So the idea that you know, your personality or that society or whatever is considered to be normal is a construction is something that I feel like a lot of gay people and especially trans and queer people um, understand maybe sometimes earlier than other people because they are, you know, so, yeah, you know, there's discrimination that they have to deal with and they have to compare their normality or what they feel is normal to the rest of the world so early on and, and kind of like start thinking about it. So I, th so I think that that's where I connect with this community. Um, and then there are lots of queer and gay people who don't think about those yeah, things. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. 
that just want to have a good yeah. time. But I think that it, what what I, and that's also something that I love about the gay community or the queer community. But but I think that, that there's like a uh, you know there's a psychedelic experience to being queer that I can relate to that goes beyond you know the Pride Festival or you know there's outside experience outsider experience yeah. that and, I, and I think too. that that is a theme that kind of carries through some of your music is like uh or some of the lyrics you know that kind of feeling of being outside you know even in a song like dancing on your own kind of feeling left out or um dancing on my own separated from a situation you know and have that outside of feeling and i think that like um from an outsider's perspective just seeing that i can see that those kind of connections between your music and the community and i think that there's many parallels in that um yeah a lot of people understand that mm. feeling you know it, it's a part of, of being a human being. Like it can be, you know, it can be a race issue. It can be a you know, gay issue. It could be a, and it could be so many things, you know, it could be just having an experience of, you know, that there are different perspectives and having to deal with that. I think early on is. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, is something that we can relate to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to move on to um, your dancing a bit. So I, you know, from my perspective, you have quite a, uh, well, your dancing is quite iconic, really. You, the way you dance and the way that, I think so. I think that the way that you move is very um, signature to you, I think. And uh, I think that that's something that I love about both yourself and channel as performers is that there's this kind of, um, I see parallels between the way that you dance, even if it's like different styles in a way, because it's like when you're dancing, it feels like an extension of the music in the way that you guys express yourselves. And it's like, it's rather than feeling like a, a choreographed routine necessarily, it really, for me, watching both of you, of you as performers and being fans of both your music heightens the moment and the experience of hearing the music. Um, for example, and for example, okay, so your Primavera set, um, you have a 50 minute slot and you've chosen to dedicate uh, five minutes or so of a 50 minute set, which isn't very long, to just going crazy and like dancing and getting lost in between the lines and just like really wilding out. And I, I just thought that was really awesome. So I kind of wanted to ask you, um, has dancing always been something that you've cared about a lot and like, and how did you form this relationship with with dancing and expressing yourself on stage like that and and even what connection do you feel like it holds to your music hmm. uh what a nice question i think just uh, rhythm is like you know just something that i always found so in interesting yeah <laughs> nerdy but like yeah like I remember from early on, just like being very um, like drawn to music that that was that felt good in my body. I think, and and I think it just kept. It was just like an interest. Like it's like a way to get high, and um, it never gets boring to me. And I go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into that. And I, I think that you, you dance without fear. I think that that's something I feel like, and I, that's something I, I think I'm jealous of as like, you know, yeah, I, I think that because I love to dance. And I think that like, when I, when I go to raves or parties and I'm in that space, like I, you know, I will dance like no one's watching and like, and I love to dance, but I feel like the thing that I admire about you and channel again on stage is like that you really dance without fear and, it, and it's like and it's it's infectious yeah it's uh it's incredible to watch it's like trusting how it feels in the body more than thinking about what it looks like and then maybe at some point you know doing it in front of a mirror and a long time for a long, long, long Latin time. I mean, I think that's what it is. Like, if you want to, if you 
you want to feel comfortable with your dancing, I think you should just do it a cool. lot. Okay. Yeah. It's like, it's not nice. It's like, it's not um, fair to yourself, like judging your dancing if you don't do it that yeah. often. You know, it's, yeah. you get rusty. Definitely. I think, yeah. If there's one thing I, I take from today, then it's like, I'm going to start dancing more because. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's such a beautiful thing, and it's like you know we all make dance music. <laughs> it's like, and I think having that uh, that I just like I said, I think that having that element to your show, it, it like it heightens some of the music. Um, I, on the on the topic of between the lines, I kind of wanted to explore that a little bit. Um, I, I love that record. It's it's really like it kind of stands out as being kind of different to anything else you've made before in a way but at the same time very you and it's um and I love the fact that you shot the video in Pikes in Ibiza um and you know Pikes having the history it does um I kind of wanted to ask you about do you have any particular connection to the island and to Pikes is Ibiza a place that you spent a lot of time I started going there like a few years back and uh yeah, maybe like eight years ago or something. And I just just been going every summer, getting to place and getting to know the people who you know, who are there. There are a lot of people who are there every year. Mm. Um and yeah. I, I tried to t to not talk about it for a long time because I didn't want people to go there. <laughs> it's like it was, I think I was considered so cheesy for a while and I was happy that people thought that way. Now it's getting cool. Yeah, I think the thing about Ibiza for me is like, I always say, because some people have like a, a view of Ibiza who haven't, usually people that haven't been, they'll be like, oh, it's like... Uh, let's, let's not talk about it. Okay, we're going to keep it secret. It's really like the cheesiest, most horrible. The clubs suck. Everything's whack. Don't Sticky go. floors, rubbish music. Like, okay, we'll leave it there. People are horrible. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave that there. Um, so kind of, I was talking about you and Channel dancing, and um, I, I wanted to talk about our our friend Channel for a moment, and just um, you had Channel on tour with you. Um, I think it was last year, and um. Uh, I've known Channel a few years now, and and when he kind of you know got confirmed support slot, we were all so excited because you know we were all like fans of your music, and you know I know it meant a lot to him. And I just uh, I wanted to ask you what it was like having Channel on tour and and watching him perform on stage every night with you, or before you were going on. Well, he's such a sweet guy. I think you know you can just tell immediately when someone's like emotionally intelligent he's got like this way where he will he will make sure you know who he is by without saying so much but he kind of tells you anyway with the way he the things that he doesn't say or the things that you know how nice he is he's very inclusive he's very polite you know he's very polite everybody really loved him on tour like all the band everybody his dancers were great like we just had like I could just tell like he was doing this from like a good place, like an intelligent place. There are layers in what he does. I feel like he can, I feel like he's going to start singing at some point. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like he's going to like evolve and there's going to be lots of different ways that he's going to express himself. Yeah. Don't you? Absolutely. I, I like, whenever I kind of talk about a channel, I'm always like, I, I don't know another channel. Like, yeah, I think he's like a very, exceptionally talented person and I think that he just um you know it, it's like it's funny when you're, you're friends with someone but then you're able to kind of view them as an artist as well and as a fan and, and I just I, I think I really I'm excited to see what he does because I think I could imagine in 10 years time just looking back and him having created something really incredible that kind of just yeah he's so open like, he's so open mm. to say mm. uh, i feel like it's gonna go into his you know computer in there and like it's good there's gonna be some mm. process and something's gonna come out yeah. that i didn't expect well how did you guys meet we met so 
Um, my friend Scott um, lives in LA, so Scott works for WME, but he became a very, he's a young guy and he's a little bit older than me. And when I first started going to LA, I had no friends. So Scott was um, the assistant to my agent at WME, but Scott kind of took me under his wing and started um, just looking after me when I was in LA, I'd like sleep on his couch. and. So we would go out together and we'd go to these parties in LA, like the Rondas and, the, and we'd go out. And I remember getting back one night, um, early hours, and he was like, I'm a, I think I'm signing this guy. And uh, he mm -hmm. just put on the video to a controller. And, you know, mm -hmm. I remember watching it and just being like, having it just looked so fully formed and it was just like incredible. It was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen, but I kind of, we watched it and I forgot about it. I didn't forget about the music, but I kind of forgot about channel as a person because I then met channel through Scott. We hung out and it took me the whole night to then connect. I was like, Oh, so we kind of became friends through this night out together that we had. And it was only then I kind of connected it back to the music. I was like, Oh my God, it's the guy like, and I had then the, the dot, like the dots joined, but me and channel then I guess through like a, a mutual love of, of electronic music and going out, we just started to go out to clubs a lot together and just like, and he would you know channel, uh, everywhere I go with channel in LA, you know, like cha LA's kind of became, well, before all this global pandemic stuff, it kind of became like a second home to me. Whenever I went out with channel, he's like, any bar is at like everyone on the door would be like, channel <laughs> come in like he's just like coolest guy and like in uh in silver lake you know it was just like it was it was so cool but he showed me so much of la and la's nightlife and uh we just we have a lot of you need a like sorry you need a person like that yeah you do and he really he really helped, he really helped open up la to me because like i think when i first started going I, I hated it because I didn't know anyone and it just felt like this kind of, um, you know, a place to go and work. Whereas he, he really like helped me fall in love with LA and kind of have some fun there. So yeah, we've, we've had so many good times like over the last few years. And so I'm, I'm yeah, very grateful to call him a friend. So, but it's, um, you, um, you did this song with him that I could be on. I just, you know, it's, I feel very, I feel very lucky to have, you know, I, I feel very happy to have been the person to kind of end up being the, the link between you two because I felt like, you know, coming off the tour, you guys had such a connection. It was like, obviously, you two had kind of grown this appreciation for each other. And, and I just like, I feel very lucky to have ended up in there, you know, through providing a musical bed for. <laughs> yeah um cool so i kind of covered a lot of what i wanted to talk about really um but i i had one more question which is um just kind of a question a fun one that i'm just going to ask everyone um who's yeah. a part of this album which is um you're djing it's you know you're at your your favorite party in the world and the lights come on and you got one more song to play what's the song <laughs> wow <laughs> there's so many good ones i can't choose. okay so so instead of the song let's pick one okay so let's say let's say first party back last song yeah last song of the night <laughs> Um, I felt Acid House Love by Hit House. Cool. Sick. I, l I love that. It's good I saw you, uh, yeah. I saw a video of you at Warehouse Project once. It's on my Twitter feed playing um, Josh Wink, I think. Ah, yeah. that, that was a cool yeah. video. That was sick. Like, that. That's one of those tracks. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a that's a yeah, banger. That's a I, I love that you love Acid House as well. That's um that's awesome. <clears throat> but you should check out that um should check out Hit House. You should check out that artist. He made a great album in eighty seven. 
only album cover I know with a guy with a camel toe on it. <laughs> and on that bombshell, <laughs> I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you for doing this and for diving into the world of electronic music with me. I think like it's really, it's really important to me that you know with this album, I just kind of, I just really wanted to have these conversations just to you know even join some dots for myself and just you know and have these conversations and just like and to learn from the people that are part of this album too so i really yeah it's gonna be great i, w- I want to watch these interviews thanks so much robin i'll speak to you soon thank you yeah we'll speak soon